Welcome everyone to the Gitcoin live stream, speaking of shit shows, uh, about ETH2. Um, we've got developers from many prominent projects in the space that are here to talk about ETH2, to enlighten everyone about what's going on with, with ETH2. Uh, so if you're joining the live stream to, to find out about ETH2, you're in the right place because we've got developers from Prismatic Labs, Canesafe, Pegasus, and Quilt, many other projects here to talk about ETH2. And uh, I've set up a Slido here. So if you guys have questions uh, for the ETH2 developers, then you can enter it into the Slido. I will enter the first question in here because I just want to preempt it before it comes up. Um, and that's when will ETH2 launch? <laughs> uh, so uh, go to the Slido and ask questions if you have, if you have questions for the, for the ETH2 developers. So uh, I'd love for everyone to do a quick intro of who you are and what you're working for or working on. Uh, I will nominate Greg, Greg the Greek, to go first. And if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself, talking about what you're working on, and then nominating someone else to introduce themselves, then that would be great. What up? My name is Greg, or Greg the Greek, if you follow me on those things. Uh, I'm from Chainsafe. Uh, we're building Lodestar, E2 client in JavaScript. Um, Primarily right now, I'm just focused on dev tooling stuff while a lot of the team's actually building out, you know, like an in-browser light client, in-browser nodes and other awesome browser tooling. Um, really happy to say actually we just uh, recently got our BLS audited by Least Authority. Everything's good and you can do BLS things in the browser now safely. And uh, to be honest, I'm really curious, like how many people here are actually like legit ETH2 people? Um, and I'll let Zach go up next. Hey, I'm Zach Paul. Uh, I, I am uh, with White Block, and we work on testing, platform, tooling, uh, primarily working on ETH2 stuff. Lately, I've been working on going down the list of ETH2 clients and just kind of messing them all up. Um, the one we've been working on lately is Prism um that's the one that we've been messing up the most lately um i um uh, i'm five nine um i'm uh scorpio um and my favorite eth2 developer is joe Dolan. so i'm gonna let him go next thank you zach hey thanks zach uh, yeah, I'm Joe DeLong. I uh, work uh, for Pegasus. Uh, we have a team called TXRX. It's a E2 research team. And uh, we've also built the Teku client. Um, and, uh, yeah, so Matt Carnett. Hi, I'm Matt. I work on a team called Quilt under Consensus R&D. We've been focused on phase two for Ethereum 2 for the last year, trying to figure out any open questions that still exist and trying to solve them. So phase two is basically just all of the execution related to Ethereum 2. Um, Mammy. Hi. I'm Mimi from Status. Uh, I'm working on uh, Nimbus, uh, which is uh, an Ethereum 2 client with a focus on um, mobile and restricted devices. And now I nominate. Huh. Where are the if 2 developers? You push, That's uh, what I was wondering. Participants, <laughs> then uh, you should be able to see a list of everyone. I think we may have gotten through uh, everyone who's actively working on ETH2. So maybe so we'll, well. we'll tee off. Alrighty. Well, um, yeah, just as a note, we were going to have Will, but uh, Will had to uh, make his way back to the US during the uh, whole travel ban situation. So um, we'll have to do without him today. Yeah, what about Terrence? Terrence had a team meeting, uh, and uh, Terrence from Prismatic had a team meeting, and we were trying to get him to join late, so he may pop in late. Terrence. So uh, I, I guess 
Uh, just just to start from the top, knowing the Gitcoin community, which are all active users of the Ethereum one chain, um, how would you describe uh, what ETH2's goals are and how it's going to enhance and extend, transcend and include ETH1? And any of y'all feel free to, to jump in uh, and we can kind of popcorn around. So uh, Joseph or Zach, would love to have you chime in. Sure, yeah, I'll go for it because it seems like that's a scary first question. I think um, through, throughput for uh, is um, is probably the most uh, uh, the the largest um, development for E two, increasing the just the transactional throughput for through the network. There are a lot of kind of like side um, enhancements that come from the designs, and people are working to maximize those but mostly um, network throughput. It's like, you can only, you have one chain, you can do so many transactions and you can scale uh, a single chain um, by block size, but it's not really a good scaling mechanism. Um, so you have to kind of like make separate chains and have a, um, a different kind of like coordination system in between them. Right. So as I understand it, um, basically, if you scale up just the block size, then you create a centralization problem because then only a certain number of people can afford to run nodes. And there's a scalability trilemma between um, speed. Uh, 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 exactly. Could you, could you Sa describe safety, the scalability? Yeah, so uh, security, what's it? Safety, oh. liveness, and uh, yeah. transition. Well, you're, well, well, as the block size increases, um, you're also going to be more affected by latency within the network and that's going to uh, increase the uh, your uncle rate and the higher the uncle rate there's going to be a direct correlation with overall security within the network so as the uncle rate increases um, the uh, lower the security threshold is going to be within the network especially in a proof of work uh, mm -hmm. no, a, a chain um, so there's right. like a, I think it was like for every like one, every like, like uh, uh, at a particular threshold, like you don't actually require 51% control of, of, uh, of all of the hashing power in order to actually execute a uh, 51% attack if there's, uh, if, the, if the uncle rate uh, hits a particular like, num uh, like threshold. Mm -hmm. Got it, thanks. But so is this is this scalability trilemma? Is that just a fundamental derivative of cap theorem, which is something pretty, that pretty you know much. consistency? At, okay, got it. Um, yes. I, Every, if I got it, go ahead. But everybody needs to have their own triangle, uh, in case you didn't know. Like so, <laughs> so they're gonna rename it. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> um, to, yeah. Because go ahead, Matt. Okay, yeah, I was just gonna say, just to like extend on that, I feel like there's two things that we're trying to scale with ETH2, and those are data availability and like actual processing of data. And we already have like a really good way of scaling data availability with a paper that Vitalik co-authored in 2018 uh, via data sampling. And so this is like, this makes it so that now clients who are have the same kind of minimum hardware requirements that we're already expecting, like a Raspberry Pi or something, they can potentially agree that a lot more data is available than like the traditional ETH1 chain. But when it comes to processing, if we continue to keep the node requirements where they are for ETH1, then we're going to only see the same amount of transaction throughput like per shard. And so the scaling of processing comes by paralyzing those across many shards. And those shards may not necessarily be able to communicate synchronously. And so this is kind of where we're trying to like understand like how are dApps going to communicate across these shards? How mm -hmm. are, um, how are we gonna build applications and like decide like where these applications need to live? Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Yeah, I remember, uh, well, just to get into it, I remember being at DevCon last year and talking to a few developers that were sort of worried that ETH2 because of the sharding, because of the sharding architecture was gonna uh, change the way composability worked on the Ethereum network. So if you think about uh, Compound, which is built on top of DAI, uh, as a as a dependency, does Compound have to live on the same chain uh, as Dai? My argument yeah. is that like we've got to the transactional throughput on a single shard is going to be closely equivalent to what we already have in ETH one, and so mm -hmm. if we want to continue using 
Ethereum 2, like everyone uses ETH1, then it's going to continue working the same way. It's just that now we've opened up a lot of other potential for applications to be built on other shards. And like, if you decide that you want to build on another shard and you're going to have to transact maybe asynchronously, and we're going to build tools to make this really easy for developers, but we're not like taking away things that they can already do. We're just giving them like more things that they can do. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah, I know that uh, I read on the ETH research forums that there's now something called Yank, which will allow you to pull something from one shard to another, if I'm not totally mistaken. There's like a laundry list of ways of doing cross-shard communication. Yank is like one of them. Got it. Okay. Well, maybe one, uh, maybe one way to orient this discussion uh, is, is with the Slido, which I've posted in the chat right here, and I see that people are starting to put some questions in. Uh, if if y'all have questions, please feel free to put them into the chat or into the Slido. If not, I will just ask the questions that are most interesting to me and maybe Scott will chime in as well. W one way to organize the discussion though from first principles might be uh, with respect to the ETH2 roadmap, which I understand is broken up into, uh, into several different phases. And I understand the first phase is the beacon chain and have been told that that will be maybe launching uh, in in 2020 uh could could you tell the gitcoin community how their lives will change with the launch of the beacon chain and what to expect with with the launch of the beacon chain uh i'll nominate uh zach cole since we haven't heard from him for a sec <laughs> yeah so what was that the beacon chain yeah so basically uh the first phase will be the beacon change chain launch and uh you know i figured that you're a good yeah. person to ask this question too because i think you're trying to break a lot of the stuff that will go into production yeah so that's kind of just like phase zero the way that i view it is like more like phase zero is kind of more of an experimental phase that allows us to kind of um, um, um stake and experiment with that staking process um and validating and um that's kind of really the whole point of phase zero and I don't really see much coming out of phase zero other than like personally other than like an experimental phase that allows us to just stake validate get the ball rolling and experiment with different uh procedures and processes um for staking and validating and that's, that's the purpose for the beacon the beacon chain uh for phase zero so if I'm a Gitcoin user and I'm actively using the mainnet, then my life doesn't change that much with the Beacon Chain. No, launch. no. Okay. I mean, because I mean, the ETH one X chain is essentially going to be independent of the ETH two Beacon Chain at that point in time until we figure out how to roll up ETH one as like a execution mm -hmm. environment um, that's going to work within and operate within ETH two. Uh, this might be a good time, actually. Uh, to talk a little bit about what you've been up to with White Block and the White Block platform and sort of your role in the deployment of ETH2, Zach. I'd love to, <clears throat> to zoom in on that for a sec. Yeah, so what I've been working on is like automating the entire process of like deploying the validator contract, um, submitting um, uh, uh, Ethereum within that contract as validators, um, but all within a controlled environment and then deploying Prism nodes. And then we're gonna start working on Lighthouse nodes and then uh, Nim Nimbus and working our way down the list. So we have like an actual functional replication of like the Beacon node and uh, all of the ETH2 clients replicating that like uh, Beacon chain, like start ceremony. And mm -hmm. uh, um, what, what we did what we worked on and started on for ETH Denver actually was doing, uh, implementing like a chain split. So we'll, uh, um, um, we'll, we implement a network partition between validators and beacon um, nodes and uh, uh, for a period of time. And then we reconcile them and we try to observe the behavior between these nodes and within the network when this occurs. And we wanna see what happens when they reconcile. And we started working on that with Prism nodes and got a lot of pretty, uh, saw a lot of undefined behavior that a lot of that people probably didn't really expect. And I don't really want to put the Prism guys on blast, so I'm not going to share any. I'm not going to like share the results just yet. 
Uh-huh. Um, uh, but uh, um, we found some stuff and we're fixing it and we're going to go down the list and work on all the clients and then eventually we'll put out a multi-client test network and uh, that's just meant to kind of mess things up. Another thing we did was we wrote like a malicious um, a malicious uh, validator that kind of just spams the network with multiple proposers. So I'm trying to break consensus essentially and see what happens. Mm. So I'm pretty pretty good at making thing uh, at messing things up. Not really great at making things work. You can ask my wife about that. So. Okay. Well, maybe we'll go on a double date sometime, and our wives can talk about that together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah I remember seeing a tweet maybe six months ago when the first multi-client test net was all talking to each other. I remember a screenshot and maybe like a picture of you all in a house, you locked your all in a house uh, back before social distancing was a thing to, to get that to, to work. So it seems like we're continuing to iterate forward from that progress. Yeah, so that was the interop lock-in. That was, uh, that was back in, what was that, Joe? August or something like that? It was September. September, September. Oh. yeah. 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 I didn't yeah. go because I was getting married. So, yeah, it was interesting. I mean, like we like all kind of like got locked in there and we were able to make a lot of progress, I think, because like you're able to communicate with the um, people, some things that could take, you know, a few days round trip and communication can be settled um, uh, sitting next to someone for in about, you know, two or three minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. yeah, and, and as I understand it, there's two, uh, well, depending on how you count it, two to, to four clients that are for the ETH1 uh, mainnet. And now with ETH2, we've got, depending on how you count them, up to up to eight or nine different teams. You know, how does the, the how, how do you all coordinate in, in, in it, it just seems like there's so many different teams that are working on this in the global asynchronous nature of the, of the core protocol uh, teams that, you know, how, how is that working these days is that there's an ETH2 uh, call, I think, that people can listen in on every once in a while. Uh, you know, any other sort of tips or learnings about uh, protocol team interoperability? Uh, Mamie, you want to do that one? You're like the only person on the call is still in a uh, implementation <laughs> team. Mm-hmm. Okay, I can do that. Um, the history of uh, Ephraim 2 collaboration is kind of uh, uh, very interesting. Uh, so at first, coordination was through HackMD, where uh, Vitalik was doing uh, updates. That was back in July 2018. He was doing updates uh, in like uh, on the Sundays. And uh, on Monday, you realized that the section that you were implementing completely disappeared. Mm. And uh, you were trying to track down, oh, wh- what is it now? And what should I be doing? And then um, Danny Ryan from the EF uh, kind of took the project management over and organized things. And we migrated to GitHub. And that's how, uh, so what's happening is that we have the research team uh, from the EF or from EF Research Forum that uh, propose um, uh, implementation and spec. We have implementers that uh, contribute and improve uh, on that. And we have a call uh, every two weeks. Uh, Now uh, we are at or 35 or something uh, for people to discuss um, uh, with voice because uh, for complex uh, things, uh, you you need the return, but uh, uh, sometimes it, it's better to just talk to people and interrupt was great at that also. Uh, another thing is uh, one of the core components uh, uh, for uh, collaboration is uh, a very good uh, test suite. Uh, something that we didn't have until uh, a year ago with uh, uh, Proto Lambda, uh, Diederik Lode- Lodecker. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I think uh, that was the main driver between uh, f- for the collaboration between teams, and uh, I think that the, uh, w- what is uh, actually uh, less tested uh, currently and less working between clients it's uh, the networking and discovery part, and um, I think this part is coming due to the lack of tests uh, at the moment. Something that we are currently addressing. Uh, 
um, but we will we'll have more tests on the networking part in the next two weeks. Got it. Thank you. So it seems like having all of the clients running against a common test suite has been an important step um, and insight. Uh, I, I just want to briefly reorient us around the uh, the Slido here, which it looks like uh, so far uh, Igor and one anonymous user is using. So uh, feel free to join the Slido and, and ask questions. Uh, Igor asks, well, actually, Igor, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, and, and uh, I'll reiterate, if, if no one else uses the Slido, I'm just going to, you know, hog this call. So you know, please use it. Um, I'll ask the second one first because the, the crack, the yesterday stuff, maybe that's more esoteric. Um, the Cosmos team, before they launched, they, they ran uh, a game, a uh, game of stakes. Um, you know, uh, Zach, you were saying you're trying to break things. Um, if, you, if you ever listened to Sonny talk about game of stakes, uh, it, was a, it was a great success, actually, because uh, it was all of the validators were running and they were, they were all trying to do crazy things to break each other. Um, and, and, you know, it just seemed like a lot of fun as well as, as, a, a, an exercise to gain a lot of knowledge about, about the validator systems and, and the edge cases, et cetera. Um, so I've asked before on some different ETH2 calls and I know that there's probably nothing yet planned. Um, I'm just wondering about from, from the developers of these clients, are you guys thinking about reaching out to other, other chains, other teams? Uh, not just specifically other Ethereum clients, but folks like Cosmos or Tezos who have had some experience kind of going to production with these things and maybe either, you know, uh, running a game of stakes for Ethereum spe ETH2 specifically or, or other things. Like, are you guys uh, thinking about that yet or is it still too early? Have you seen the price of ETH lately? <laughs> Might be a bit I, difficult. Yeah. Incentivize testnet so hot right now. Uh, no, but yeah, we definitely talked to Sunny and um, I think um, Danny Ryan from the E2 implementation has talked about uh, the uh, possibility of um, an incentivized testnet, like the game of stakes testnet. Um, <clears throat> I think mm -hmm. that that's probably going to happen. Um, I think we have to have a a long living multi client test net before that happens, though. Mm -hmm. Got it. How could the, you know, assuming that a multi uh, incentivized test net does come around, how can the community rally around banging on it? I mean, you know, should Gitcoin integrate bounties onto the multi client test, test net as part of our like cross chain strategy? Or, you know, how can the community rally around y'all if it happens? Or is that a better question for if and when it actually launches? Like when it when it goes up, <clears throat> we're definitely going to need people to be validators or mm -hmm. um, post validator nodes for sure. Um, I don't know. Uh, what do you think, Mamie? Uh, sure, we need people to be validators. We also need people to teach uh, about like how to install uh, Lighthouse, Prism, Nimbus, uh, Teku, um, and uh, we will need people. Um, all over the world because uh, maybe uh, we will have a crash on Nimbus at four o'clock in the in the night and no one uh, will be up because most of us are in Europe and same thing for uh, Lighthouse who's in Australia uh, and uh, Prism who are in, in the US. So first that. Um, otherwise it's probably too soon uh, today to talk about this and if we actually uh, do something. I remember uh, that uh, we had this conversation like a bit off uh, during the interrupt, uh, maybe after some beers, I don't remember exactly. And uh, uh, I guess uh, before we announce that we will do that, we will consult the community on how they want to, to go with it. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it, thanks. Uh, uh, Igor, you had a sort of follow-up question that you posted here about the Cosmos team. Did, did you want to jump in again? Oh, just that, um, you know, the, the Cosmos folks have, have a, had experience. I mean, obviously, it's a different protocol, different consensus algorithms, et cetera. But uh, in, in my experience, a lot of this comes from um, maybe a month ago, there was a Dystopian Labs uh, virtual conference on 
staking and validators. It was a validator summit. And so uh, there was a lot of great collaboration. I encourage everyone to go back uh, if they're interested in this topic and just uh, get, get stuff from different teams. Um, the thing that I was mostly surprised about is how many folks out there uh, are running actually, you know, Tezos baking rigs or Cosmos validated, like professional teams are, are doing this kind of stuff and they have, they have a lot of infrastructure built for equivocation and, and making sure that you don't, you know, equivocate and, and all this stuff. So the, the validator infrastructure uh, is actually further along than I think some ETH 1.0 folks might actually really realize. It really opened my eyes that, you know, I know obviously we're, we're getting there, um, but other teams already, other chains are already there. Now, their blockchains aren't necessarily doing anything besides validating empty blocks, right? We have, Ethereum has a lot more traffic, but um, some of these problems around you know, signers going offline or, you know, resiliency kind of all this kind of stuff. There, there's a lot of folks out there that are, that are building and have built stuff. So uh, it was just really eye opening for me, um, you know, being an Ethereum maximalist, I was like, Oh, no one else is really that advanced, but for some validator systems, specifically Tezos and Cosmos, I think, I think there is sophisticated infrastructure out there. Got it. Uh, so I guess less of a question for the for for our guests than more of a statement that we should be maybe learning from other protocols that have have done incentivized test nets and what what has been done before. Yep, and they're and they're friendly and collaborative as as far as I can tell. I mean, I know we're all often tribal, but uh, yeah. yeah. Great, guys. So you, oh, go ahead, Manny. Uh, yeah, the, the development of of Eve two is. Uh, less tribal uh, because uh, we're building on lip P2P, so collaborating with uh, the team from uh, Protocol Labs and Filecoin. Uh, on the cryptography uh, side, uh, we are using uh, BLS signatures and pushing forward standardization across uh, uh, many blockchains like uh, Definity, Chia Network, uh, Filecoin, uh, Algorand. So, uh, we we, ha we actually do cooperate with others. Mm -hmm. Okay, great point. Yeah, uh, great. I was just gonna say I uh, <clears throat> I've given a lot of talks on this actually last year about the amount of collaboration that we have already, but we should probably get. I mean, one of the bigger areas that I think this entire blockchain space that whole doesn't have is. Um, like more generic tooling across the different like blockchains and whatnot. Like right now we might be sharing BLS standards and whatnot, but I, I'm pretty sure like our G2 points are different for, than, you know, some of the other ones, which means that we have to go and start modifying how our BLS works. Um, similarly, it's like we have a bloody MetaMask for every single chain that exists, which is kind of annoying. Um, you know, there's like still a lot of work to do and like the staking infrastructure would be cool, but I bet you most of that staking infrastructure is like tightly coupled to the specific chain that they're running. Um, mm -hmm. it probably isn't just like throwing a Docker instance against like whatever their shit is. It's probably like very much tightly integrated and they would not be able to stake on ETH2. Um, mm -hmm. definitely would be cooler to see more stuff that's cross chain supported. Now, I understand that because Ethereum 2 will be based off of proof of stake, it'll be much easier to run a node. So I could run a, uh, I do have a rack of Raspberry Pis in my garage and I could run a node there. Um, do you think that staking as a service services will become a thing? And does that introduce a centralization risk at, at all when we think about that staking infrastructure? They already exist, right? Like there's like massive staking pools. Like I see them on Twitter all the time. Um, stake dot fish or something like that i don't know there's a, there's, yeah, there's definitely going to be a lot of staking as a service i mean because the the average person that just has a bunch of money i mean think about the user base for coinbase versus you know mining or something like that i mean like people are going to be much more apt to just pay somebody else some money to just stake than they are to like run that infrastructure themselves like admittedly i'm staking tezos on coinbase right now just because i can't be ours to like 
run that infrastructure on my own. And also, I don't really give a shit enough about mm-hmm. Tezos. I was just like, oh, look, I can just do this right now. I don't really mm-hmm. care. Like, you know. Uh, one, uh, thing, one thing I'm worried about uh, with uh, staking as a service is that um, with uh, proof of stake, you need to have your private uh, key on uh, the uh, staking service. Uh, because you need to sign uh, transactions. So this means that your private key uh, is mm. uh, in uh, another uh, host that you might not uh, uh, trust. So mm. you you have your 32 ETH at risk. Mm. Yeah, so it's essentially like a custodial service. Yeah. I think, isn't Rocket Pool trying to solve that? Yeah, but I think the rocket pool like over collateralizes, or at least like one to one collateralizes the stake. No. Well, hold on, That's Kevin. Like... Are you drinking out of a bullet bourbon bottle? I, I am, but let it be known for the live streamers that this is water. <laughs> this is just my water bottle. Yeah, right. That's what I call water too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> can't do. Can't get through the day without my water. You know. Yeah. What I mean? Well, when the world's ending, you know. Um, you know, would there be possible to come up with a scheme where you sign a message with your private key that basically blesses, like, blesses another key to basically sign transactions with respect to staking for you, but doesn't put your whole balance at risk? I mean, I only have a rudimentary understanding of these systems, but it seems like that might be one way to sidestep this sort of custody problem. But then how, then you have to be online, so, so, you know, signing for this. So you need to know when you're, when that's coming in. Well, I mean, you could delegate that key only for a limited time to sign messages on your behalf. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I don't know enough about the architecture of these questions to be asking. Maybe, maybe if one of the, the client developers can talk. I mean, there's two keys in ETH too, right? There's the there's a signing key and a withdrawal key. So maybe just chat about that real quick, like the construction. Oh, interesting. Because I don't know that everyone knows how ETH to validate our keys and withdrawal keys work, et cetera. Yeah, so you have two keys, one that signs. When you make, so you, when you dep- make a deposit, you put two keys in, your withdrawal key and your signing key. Um, okay. I think your withdrawal key is actually like hidden, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then basically the signing key is responsible for purely in, uh, for doing the actual validation process when you've got new attestations coming in and whatnot and you need to propose blocks. That's what your signing key is used for. When you actually want to go and exit and take your funds back, those funds will actually go to your withdrawal key. Um, so your signing key could be compromised, but you can still withdraw. Mm-hmm. But so like, it's a concept of like hot and cold. Right. But if your signing key is compromised, uh, someone could uh, sign uh, multiple transactions that are uh, conflicting and you get slashed. So you won't get your money, but it can uh, uh, empty your, uh, your deposit. Okay. Yeah, but the time to, um, the amount you'd get slashed and the time that you'd be able to actually go and withdraw, we're talking like a very, very small amount, right? It's on, you only get, you only, the exit time, as soon as you initialize the exit time, I don't, that's like less than an epoch, isn't it? So like how much can you really get slashed? Well, you can, in that weak subjectivity period, you can get slashed for any previous blocks, right? So like they could, let's say that you sign for a block, um, or uh, you attested to something, they could go back and find those same uh, uh, the same blocks and attest to a different one, right? This is also fascinating to me as an engineer because uh, I mean it's a distributed systems problem, and I'm I'm just a humble web app developer, so the amount of complexity it seems like increases when this becomes a distributed system and. Uh, it's all it's all very cool i want to tackle the pooling one though i think mm -hmm. it does like present like risk right but like um you know the minute that you're able to kind of um you know the idea that you could restrict somebody from doing that um uh is probably not the solution the solution is probably make harder systems than that well, but also, like, are you talking about like validator pools? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, but does not also present like a more centralized system? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, yeah. So it kind of defeats the purpose of proof of stake, really, unless we're assuming there's going to be a much larger subset of you individual or independent users. Yeah, totally. And I mean, you can you can leave your crypto on an exchange too. It's like not a good behavior, but you know, there's nothing stopping you from doing it, kind of thing. So the barrier to entry in order for me to like act as a validator needs to be lower than it than the barrier to entry for me to just like stake using Coinbase. Yeah, and and I think again uh, for those that might not know the differences between some of these systems, like. Coinbase has Tezos staking. I think it's 5%, Zach. I think I'm getting it too. You get 5% if you stake through Tezos. Tezos is a delegated proof of stake system. So um, you know, maybe that's also something you guys want to describe the difference between delegated proof of stake and the ETH2 style kind of proof oh, of Oh, yeah, stake. that's a good point. A yeah, delegate? So, oh, go for it, dude. Yeah, so like DPoS is something similar to like EOS where they have these uh, like predefined subset of validators that are uh, submitting on your behalf. So you're submitting to these, uh, these like master node, essentially, like essentially like master node validators um, that are then submitting those transactions to the network on your behalf. And they're pretty much like these like souped up like bad boys that are like mm -hmm. uh, um, kind of like acting in round robin fashion or however they're selected. Um, so not anybody can just be like a validator. Um, so um, I guess within ETH2, all that's required, the only barrier to entry in order to be a validator is to just have 32 ETH that you stake and have the hardware that's required in order to run. And the idea is that it's not gonna require uh, commodity hardware, and you'll be able to run a validator on something like a Raspberry Pi. Uh, but we'll see if that's, yeah, I mean, it's, that's the design intention, at least. Yeah, I, go ahead, I'll, Joseph. Oh, sorry. Um, for DPoS, I, I think, like, as a scaling strategy, it's an interesting strategy um, in that you kind of, like, you're, like, using this representative democracy where, you know, these, these nodes are, you know, they're, they're um, kind of super nodes and you have um, kind of like uh, delegated this responsibility to them to, to have it. But the downside is, is that there's, <clears throat> there's a finite level of scalability where I think what we're trying to design in sharding is um, more of a paralyzable, paralyzable, <laughs> parallel um, scalability <laughs> um, mm -hmm. with, uh, which will allow you to scale kind of like n on n chains, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of like a question of where the consent of the government sort of come from in these in these systems. Uh, I'd almost compare a DPoS system to the Senate here in the United States, and maybe uh, the proof of stake that we're working on is more like a House of Representatives, or even more more populist or more distributed than that. You know, assuming that you can get a, a and in, in, in a heterogeneous mix of, uh, I'm sorry, uh, if you can get a distributed mix of validators across all the different shards, which is probably, you know, an interesting distribution problem there. Yeah, like if we're talking about like democratic representations, it's probably more like a, um, a direct democracy or um, uh, 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 like um, a referendum. Right. Yeah. Um, that, does, that does mean, you know, and, and sorry for kind of jumping in. Uh, Please do. Everyone, I work at Consensus and I work on some of these kind of like technical sales stuff for ETH2 and, and working with our enterprise clients. So I do talk about this stuff all the time. It does, re it does create uh, an interesting kind of uh, onus on the validator, on running the validator, right? Like, Ideally, you know, kind of what Zach was alluding to, ideally you could just turn the thing on and forget it, forget about it. Um, but once you start trying to maintain 100% uptimes, once you add redundancy, et cetera, you know, uh, one of the things that happens to a lot of kind of pro amateur validators is they'll build a redundant system and they'll get some idea that their primary system is offline. So they'll fire up their backup system and now 
oh, your primary system wasn't actually offline, it was online, and now you're double signing, you're equivocating. And that's basically the worst thing you can do in, about, in a proof of stake system is, is equivocate uh, blocks. Uh, you'll get slashed, you'll get you know, kicked off. And so, you know, the, ideally it would be this referendum where it's bring your own device and have your own kind of stake, but there's definitely a technical barrier there that, uh, you know, is, is, it might not be extremely one of the things that you do start to see from some of these higher end uh, systems where hedge funds or, or folks with lots of money are, are starting to do it like, uh, you know, like getting slashed for 5% of, of, you know, like $50 million worth of staked funds is not acceptable. Um, so these systems do have to be kind of really, really resilient in a way that um, systems of the past may, may not have been. So we'll see how hobbyist it can be, but I, you know, I, I'm just afraid that your hobbyist, your hobbyist validator might think that they're more capable of, of running a validator, staking a lot of beef, and then you know, they'll get slashed without kind of uh, knowing it. Hey, Igor, I'd also jump in and say that, let's say you can design a perfect, you know, a perfect system where it's super easy um, and hobbyists are encouraged and, you know, and want to jump in there and validate. Like, uh, there is an economy, an inherent economy of scale. Um, you're still going to form super nodes. People are going to want to be as efficient as possible, you know, with their hardware, with their electricity usage. Um, with everything. And I think even, I think Colin Myers wrote an article, he kind of tried to break down some of those costs just to show that there was an economy of scale. Um, and, and so, you know, even, even if we did solve that problem, we can still form super nodes, um, you know, which is, when I say super node, I basically mean like a, you know, like a beacon node, you know, that's basically processing messages and, you know, and keeping up with the head of the chain. And then, you know, and having, you know, hundreds and hundreds of validators attached to it. So, so not one beacon node, one validator. So, um, so I'd say that's also, um, I'd say that's also a problem as well. So. Thanks. Uh, so I just want to do a quick time check. We're at about 50 past the hour. Um, <clears throat> if you're involved in ETH2 research or uh, working on ETH2 uh, and I invited you to the call, I'd like to, to ask you if there's anything that I didn't ask that you want to tell us about your work or about ETH2. So anything from uh, a closing thought to just telling us where to find your project. And uh, Joseph DeLong, you're in the top left of my screen, so uh, I'll nominate you to go first. Cool, uh, yeah, uh, follow us on Twitter, TXRX Research, and we'll have all of our research updates come through there. Great, thanks Joseph. Uh, Greg, any, any sort of closing thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> we're from our end, just follow chain safe F on Twitter. Um, and we're got a couple more audits that we're kind of finalizing from a dev tooling standpoint so that, you know, you can be sure your stuff is safe and everything we're building is browser compatible first. So you dap devs and whatnot that want to kind of start experimenting, feel free to head over to Lodestar, chain safe forward slash Lodestar on GitHub, and you'll be able to safely, you know, play around with uh, stuff as it comes out. And it should be compatible with like all these test nets that are running with Prismatic and Lighthouse Very and cool. Nimbus. All right. Uh, Zach, you're next. Anything you want to tell us about White Block and what you've been up to? Uh, yeah, I'm at 0xzak on uh, Twitter. And uh, we're at White Block on Twitter. And we're about to roll out all of our ETH2 support. Um, so it's free to use so you can download and start testing, um, uh, use our CLI utilities. Um, you can just spin up your own test nets and, uh, start experimenting and breaking stuff and reporting it. And, uh, it's fun. Great stuff. Repeat. Right. I think you're maybe underselling it a little bit. You can spin up your own ETH2 testnet on Blake Block Genesis. Which is yeah, so, cool. so I mean, what, what I've been doing is like trying to max out. I mean, we like what we what I did last was like spun up a network with 100,000 beacon chain uh, validators and um, 
uh, beacon chain nodes and validators for Prism. Um, I've been working on Prism for the past like few weeks, um, but I'm about to move in the lighthouse. So we have Prism support uh, right now. Uh, we also have lighthouse support, and then we're gonna move to Nimbus. So I'm coming for you, Mamie. Coming for you. Here. <laughs> Oh, I'm running. <laughs> um, and then I guess also to uh, what I didn't mention was like uh, the the before we moved into this phase, we were working on the P2P audits. That's what we got our uh, that's what we got the EF grant for, and uh, those results can be found in our community uh, discourse. And that's just like community.whiteblock.io. Um, so you can check out all of those reports and. Uh, get involved in the conversation there. Yeah. I've read a few of your uh, reports and I feel like I feel smarter after I, after I read them. Well, that's good. <laughs> uh, so maybe since uh, Zach picked on you, I'll nominate you to go next. Any parting thoughts about your project or where to find you online? Yes. So, um, since we are focusing on uh, mobile devices, uh, two things for people to try, uh, like, uh, right away. Um, you can build a Nimbus on uh, Raspberry Pi. Uh, there are instructions, uh, they are up to date on repo. Uh, it's uh, status uh, dash im uh, nim beacon chain. And we also have an article uh, to build a Nimbus on Android. So uh, maybe you uh, came across my tweet where we had five phones uh, running uh, Ethereum 2. And we have uh, a two-part article on uh, nimbus.status.im that explain how to build Nimbus on Android. So you can run uh, Ephraim 2 on your phone. Yes, I think that's incredible. Uh, Matt, uh, do you want to tell us about what you've been working on with, with Quilt? Sure. Yeah. So for the last few months, we've been doing a lot of work trying to understand like how execution E2 is going to work. And it sounds like it's going to be kind of this like paradigm of these execution environments that are going to define how transactions are handled. And so we're trying to build some tools to make it a lot easier to build these kinds of things and to like test them. This is something I've been working with Johnny over the last month or so on. So keep an eye out for that. And like the last like closing thought, I just want people to like know that composability is like a key part of like our design principles for phase two, ETH2. And so it's not something that like, it's like, this is not something people should worry about. This is going to be solved. This is It's going to be easy for you to develop contracts for ETH2. And it's going to work in the same way as it used to. And we're just going to let people do a lot more things that they used to be able to do. Yes. All right. Well, I I think that that's everyone that's actively working on ETH2 that we invited to the call. Although my Zoom client might only be prioritizing people who have their video on. So um, uh, I, I think that, that next uh, we were gonna direct people on this call over to the Meta, Meta Cartel uh, Intercon, which is their internet uh, conference that they're running right now. The Gitcoin live stream is right here uh, at 7 p.m. CET. And next, there is a presentation by Dandelion Main on source cred, which is a social algorithm. And there's a rare art festival happening next. So uh, I don't know what everyone's doing after this call, but you're welcome to, to head over to Intercon and, and hang out with more decentralization people there. And uh, yeah, I'd love to at this point, people are free to drop. I'd also love to just hang out and talk about what's going on in DeFi uh, over the last week or so. This is kind of my Friday afternoon hangout session now that I'm physically social distancing. You guys are my social event for this Friday evening. So feel free to hang out and unmute yourselves and ask questions and shoot the shit. Um, and if people have to run, then that's fine too. But thank you to everyone for joining the Gitcoin live stream this week. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks. Lido question, my, my other one with the DeFi stuff and the composability. Uh, so we had, we, everyone knows, right? Maker, Maker's going through, uh -huh. going through it. Um, we, we, we hit crazy load. The world's not ending. The financial systems are melting down. The, our good friend Ethereum 1.0 proof of work chain is, you know, trying to make it through. 
uh, but it's sickly and causing issues. So like in an ETH2 world, does it get more hairy? Does it get more, uh, you know, Matt, maybe this is, this is what we were just chatting about in, in chat. Like, how do you feel about what happened yesterday as it pertains to a multi-execution environment world for Ethereum? I mean, I'm not like a hundred percent sure, like exactly all the specifics of what happened yesterday. Like my understanding is basically like a lot of transactions were trying to come through and this like knocked the gas price up to like astronomic highs that is difficult to actually get transactions in. And like in ETH2, like it definitely doesn't get worse, but the question is, is like how much better can we make it? And that's like, that's going to be up to like developers. It's going to be up to like how effective is like EIP 1559 at like keeping gas gas prices at like a reasonable level um 50 like i'm it's unclear like how how much that's going to like help like alleviate these situations if we have it like the the, the shards in eth2 they they're not like increasing like the transactional throughput like for synchronous communication between contracts and so we still have the problem of if you want to be like synchronously communicating every single slot with your contract, then it's going to be best to be on that shard. And so if that shard is going to be um, saturated with lots of transactions, then potentially like there's only a finite number of transactions that can be included. And so the price of those are going to go up. I think the thing that ETH2 is going to help with is that now we don't have to have, like if, if we have a, kind of this DeFi shard where a lot of applications are on, then we don't have to try and share that with other kinds of dApps that are also trying to get their transactions in. And so hopefully that can like kind of alleviate a little bit of the pressure. And so now it's not like everybody is like fighting for just a single shard. It's that we've spread out the pressure a little bit. But I think like these kinds of scenarios, like they're like at the end of the day, there's a finite number of transactions you could fit. And so whenever you like exceed that amount, the price has to go up. You know, random question about async and synchronous shards here. Um, how long would an async request to another shard be? Let's say there was like an Oracle shard, right? Where that's where all of our price feeds were going into. Yeah. Then DeFi is on a different shard. If I go to make a request from the DeFi side to be like, hey, what's my latest price? What's like the time latency that we would have? So there's kind of like two ways you can do this. Like the first like naive way that's like would be like as part of the protocol. This changed whenever Vitalik released the new proposal at DevCon time and this in this case, like the latency is just a single slot because every time you create a new block on the beacon chain, you're link, you're cross linking in every single shard. So as long as the shard is live, i.e. like they're able to like agree on a new route, then you'll be able to like access whatever happened on that shard in the next block or the next slot on your shard. So that's like a huge improvement. And to me, this is like, this is, this makes like asynchronous communication like a lot more viable for most applications. Like sure, there are some times where synchronous communication is critical, but if we can do it within like six to 12 seconds, to me, that's like, that solves a lot of the, the problem, the concerns that people have. The second, so, okay, so like the second way that you could do it is if you do some sort of like roll up where you like separate like posting transactions with actually executing them. Because if we have like a scheme where like I can submit transactions on two shards and then we have a roll up with computers that are powerful enough to like execute the same amount of transactions on those two shards, then we can like potentially have the throughput of those of like those two shards um, combined, like for actually like processing. The like downside of this is that now you're in this like optimistic rollup format and the minimum, the minimum requirements to validate that is like higher than the minimum requirements to be a validator on ETH2. And to me, that's like for like the DeFi rollup or shard, this seems okay because if you have hundreds of thousands or millions or whatever dollars in ETH, then it's important for you to like validate this. And so running like a slightly more powerful computer than a Raspberry Pi is like an acceptable trade-off. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, I mean, the way that you described it, Greg, is like, is like a, a, a cross shard read though too. If you're not mutating state across two different shards, then it's instant. Right, you can I I can provide a witness that shows um, what the state of the thing that I'm going to check in the contract for this other shard. So as long as you're not mutating state, it's just one slot. <clears throat> uh, 
All right, so I want to uh, bring us back to the Slido and the question that I forgot to ask that uh, that came into the Slido is with which ETH researcher has the best mustache? Uh, I nominate Joseph DeLong. Yeah, I, 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 I assume that this is an anonymous individual. Definitely not me. Picking on you. I mean, who else has Can anybody else grow a mustache? <laughs> yeah. Mm. So, some of you guys probably hey, 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 hold on, hold on. Some of us can grow full beards, actually. Yeah, yeah, because mm -hmm. I have a beard with a nice mustache. I mean, define nice. Uh, that's, that's such an engineer question. <laughs> I think, I think we're, I mean, we're going to have to account for a sense as well, I think. I don't think that, you know. <laughs> Yeah. How does your mustache smell? Yeah. Can you oh. like describe it in like five words? Upper in a world where there's where there's social distancing, though, I don't know if we can have that conversation. No, like, no, no. What you have to do is you have to trim some, and then you mail it to your homeboy. <laughs> Not weird at all, dude. We just and, have a normal and, relationship. Hey, this is and, what people did before the internet, man. What and, do you think? <laughs> sent beard trimmings to each other. I see the audience numbers are starting to drop at this point. Thought, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Zach. Greg, Greg, what are you doing over there? I've seen some uh, some facial stuff going on. Do you have, like trying to edit my trying to edit my background, but my camera's so bad. <laughs> oh, there we go. What is it? <laughs> that's that's beautiful. Uh, what I love about uh, about the Ethereum protocol developers is they're working on world changing technology, but culturally they're some of the most fun, lighthearted people in the world. So I, I think you guys are keeping yourself sane a little bit by having some fun. This is gonna cause the this is gonna make number go down. I'm telling you, but the ETH to interop it was only hard work. Mm -hmm. There was no fun. So Matt, can I can I ask you a follow up question to what you were just saying about if it's a DeFi shard and you could expect a valid trade off for for you know higher competition requirements, et cetera? Do you do you envision the sharded world of being like this spectrum of hardware where there might be shards of that are that are like that don't have high requirements, and so anyone can kind of come and be a provider for the execution environment, and then like you know, there'll be the Morgan Stanley shard or, or whatever bank of your choice um, for, for the DeFi stuff that is running really expensive hardware. Is that kind of a vision or is it going to be more homogenous across the shards? I mean, this is something that like I've tried to talk to the ETH researchers about because it sounds like this is something that's interesting where you, because I mean, if you think about like shards are really just roll-ups, this is like kind of like my thesis I've like come up with over the last month. And really like these committees are just, ways of like making it a more like permissionless way of like submitting the route for these optimistic rollups. And so there's like really no reason why we couldn't expand the number of like shards or rollups on the beacon chain to say this is a new slot where the DeFi rollup lives and this is like the mechanism for like determining who the operators are. And I don't see like there's a, there's not, not there doesn't seem to me like a technical reason why not. Like there that doesn't seem like it's on the roadmap for ETH2 in the near future, like maybe down the line, phase three or four or something. Um, we can get a lot of the same benefits related to that by just doing rollups inside of shards, because realistically, there's not a lot of execution that happens in a rollup. It only happens whenever you like fall back to like the main chain. And the idea is these shards are like as secure as the beacon chain is. That's like the whole goal of it. And so if, if you take that assumption, then Yes, you should be fine. Just like doing the same thing that you would be doing inside of um, a roll up. I think it's more up to like the community. Like, do they accept the fact that if you have this like kind of DeFi shard that to communicate outside of it, there is like a trade off of like doing it synchronously? I don't know. That's like a question that I don't have an answer to. It's probably no answer yet, right? emergent consensus thing. Yeah. If, if no one has questions, I would love to just pick your brains on like, is anyone thinking about what crazy things ETH3 would even like start to 
articulate as ideas or is Tri -linear that your maps and Tri -linear maps. Proofs. yeah i don't know this is something like if you've listened to the latest year knowledge podcast with vitalik and justin they talked about this a little bit and it's i don't understand it at all i basically just like look at the wikipedia page after i heard about it and theoretically like you can have a smart contract that's able to sign things and have like an actual signature that's like verifiable off chain but you can't like look at the contract on chain and actually see like what its private key is. And so to me, that's like a major game changer that like totally opens up like the things you can do with smart contracts. Can you drop the Wikipedia article in the chat? Yeah. Can you spell it out a little bit? Why, why does that totally game change what you can do with smart contracts, Matt? Because I mean, right now, if I want to like, if I want to say, if I want a smart contract to do something, like outside of Ethereum, there's really no security because like how can a smart contract like in and of itself say like it, it believes something. Like you basically have to do a threshold signature of the people who maybe control that contract. But like I can't like print a receipt that's like redeemable on another chain unless that chain like completely trusts like Ethereum. If I have like the signature that like exists outside the concept of Ethereum, then I can just verify that I need the device, any chain, whatever. And so like when you come like, I don't know, I think there's going to be some interesting applications with like very decentralized contracts. Maybe like we can have contracts that can actually like c c create transactions themselves. This is like something that seems to like not work very well in this system. Like you always have to have like some sort mm -hmm. of like social, like, like some sort of like crypto economic way of getting people to submit transactions to kick off contracts. But if contracts can sign things themselves, then maybe there's a way of like, at this specific time, this contract is going to sign a message and that transaction is going to be propagated to the network. It's like super under like explore there. I think there's like so many possibilities whenever you can have secrets inside of smart contracts. That's, that's so cool. I feel like Matt, you're living in the future and you're just pulling us all towards it. I, uh, I'm going to read a little bit on that. I mean, I need to read a little bit on it. I basically heard about it yesterday and I was like, this is a game changer. Yeah. I'll drop the link, but the other thing they talked about is like, and this is like Vitalik's latest uh, ETH research post. It's on polynomial commitments. And I think this is like something that we're going to see, like, I don't know if it's going to make it into phase two, but like right now the problem for stateless execution is how big your like Merkle branches are to prove that things are part of the state. And this is like the, this is like the bottleneck for like all stateless execution. How fast can you like verify a Merkle branch? And there's, they've got ideas now of like doing this in zero knowledge. So I can like provide you the data that we're going to operate on and I can give you like a small proof that says all this data is valid. And so I can completely like compress like all these like Merkle branches and all the hashing that goes into it. Mm -hmm. That's so incredible. I mean, just stateless ETH2 it, itself kind of like blows my mind, especially since I know state rent and the bloat of the state in ETH1 is sort of a a topic that a lot of people have gone through. So a lot of this stuff is, is incredibly advanced. It's, it's very cool to think about a world in which this stuff is live and in the wild and, and used by, by many people. But Matt, I guess TLDR, please drop that link. I want to check it out this weekend. All right, anyone else have any, uh, any sort of questions for, for each other? I think that we're down to about 20 people. I think it's worth hanging out for maybe five more minutes, as long as we have uh, above 10 people. All right, I'll take that as a no. All right, well, everyone, thank you for coming to the Gitcoin live stream this week. It's been a lot of fun hanging out. I hope that everyone stays safe this weekend. I hope you, you all have a good weekend, and I'll see you on the, the crypto Twitters. Peace. Bye. <laughs>